Want to speak real English from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. Top 10 language learning strategies. Let's begin. Befriending or dating someone who speaks English. Watching movies or listening to music in English. Read English newspapers or magazines. Record your voice and compare your pronunciation with native English speakers. Download dialogue tracks and listen to English conversations. Repeat the phrases that you hear out loud again and again. Review all the lessons on EnglishClass101.com to master them completely. Read lines slowly at first, then reread and increase your speed. Set small and measurable learning goals with your personal deadlines. Try harder lessons to challenge yourself and improve faster. And ways to stop translating in your head. Let's get started! Identify objects around you in English. The first way to stop translating in your head is to identify the objects around you in your target language. So if you're studying English, that means you look at the objects around the room, look at the things in your life. Don't think of them in your native language first. Think of them in your target language first. So if I look around the room, I see a computer, I shouldn't think my native language word, I should think my target language word. So start with the items and the situations in your everyday life. If I say computer in English, maybe I should say computa in Japanese. I should say not, I don't know, water in English, I should say omizu in Japanese. So start associating the words in your target language with your everyday life now. So if you're studying English, that means start getting familiar with the things in your everyday life in English. Repeat phrases you hear native speakers use. Tip number two is to repeat the phrases that you hear native speakers use. So if you're watching this channel, for example, or you're watching a TV show or a movie, uh, listen for the way that native speakers make those phrases. If you hear a phrase you have never heard before, or you hear an interesting combination of words, try to repeat them yourself. Don't just listen. Try to say them yourself. If you're in a public space and it's difficult for you to do that, fine. Practice in a place where you feel more comfortable. Maybe if you have some private space to practice. Just repeat them. Get your mouth used to saying the words the way that the speakers, uh, the native speakers do. So if you never actually say words, if you're only taking in, if you're only listening and you're not actually producing the language, it's, it's kind of hard to, uh, to practice and to, um, to really hone your pronunciation, to improve your pronunciation. So when you listen to native speakers, try to repeat after them. So for example, if you're studying English, you can try to repeat after this video. You can repeat after the things I'm saying because maybe I'm using an expression or I'm using a certain uh, series of vocabulary words together the way a native speaker would. And it's a, maybe a good idea to try to practice the ways that native speakers put their words together. So try to repeat after native speakers, especially when you're looking at media. Uh, and you can do this when you're reading books too. You can try to read out, um, read out loud interesting lines of books that you find or something that maybe is difficult for you. Very nice practice tip. Make a situation where you can't escape into your native language. Make a situation where you can't escape into your native language essentially means immerse yourself. Of course, going to that country or going to a place uh, where you can speak only that language is very difficult for some of you, totally understand. But if in your life you can create a situation in your library, in your room, in your house, somewhere, for just an hour or I don't know, maybe a day, I don't know what your schedule is like, but if you can create a situation or create an environment where you have no choice but to use that language and you cannot escape, meaning you cannot uh, go back to using your native language as a crutch, you can't use the native language at all, it forces you to use the language that you're studying. So of course, if you are lucky enough to live in the country or to live in a place 
where people speak the language you're studying, great, but you have to go out and interact with people. You have to put yourself in a place where you have no choice but to speak. It's very hard and it's very scary and it's very embarrassing at first, but if you take time to find places and to make environments that are comfortable for you, where you feel comfortable making mistakes and asking questions, it's very valuable for your learning process. This is actually something that I did, totally. I totally did this. My Japanese wasn't very good for a long time, but then I started making friends who could not speak English. Uh, actually, I just did this through finding hobbies. There was a hobby that I had. I joined a group, I joined actually a school to where I could learn how to do that hobby. And everything was taught only in Japanese. And the people in my class only spoke Japanese, mostly. And then maybe we would go out for drinks and food、uh, late at night or on the weekends, and everybody spoke only Japanese. And if I couldn't communicate even simply in Japanese, I had no hope of keeping that friendship together. So it forced me to study, it forced me to think about the words they were using、uh, and to try to learn those words, those patterns, as well as how to produce them naturally myself. So I was learning the vocabulary words the people around me were using and learning how to apply them on my own. That was only possible because I had no escape <laughs> in those situations. So try to do that,、uh, even if you can do it yourself in your house. It's super helpful, I think. Watch TV and movies in your target language without subtitles. Tip number four is to watch TV and movies in your target language without subtitles. Without subtitles. So I think that watching、uh, with subtitles can be very beneficial.、Um, so if I'm watching something, or if you want to watch something with subtitles on, great. But I sometimes find that、uh, I can, in my case, I, I think too much about reading the subtitles and I forget to listen. So maybe if you've seen a movie in your target language a few times、um, with the subtitles on, try turning the subtitles off and think about. The like, character's body language, the words they're using.、Um, you can always look that up later, look up the, you know, the words you don't know in a dictionary. But try to do it、um, where you're focusing completely on the way that people are using their words. Try not to use the subtitles. So、um, kind of play around with it a little bit. If there's a word that's difficult for you to hear, you can actually turn on the subtitles in, like, the, in the native、uh, language of the movie as well. That's something that I've done. Like if,、uh, like, if I wanted to study Japanese, it's very useful when the actual words spoken in Japanese appear on the screen. Sometimes it's easier for me to catch a word if I see it visually and I hear it at the same time. So, another way to kind of、um, explore how you can use TV and movies is to actually turn on the closed captions, like the, the,、um, the words on the screen. In the native language of the movie. So,、uh, so, this is sort of two points in one. So, one, watch movies without subtitles, meaning subtitles in your native language. And hint two is to watch movies、um, with closed captioning on, but the closed captioning is in your target language, not in your native language. So, you can try those two things with TV and with、um, movies. Don't bring a dictionary to your lesson. Tip number five is don't bring a dictionary to your lesson. Okay. So, give me a second here. So, I understand that dictionaries, especially electronic dictionaries, we have them on our phones now, are very, very convenient.、Um, of course, it's important to use them and it's, they're a great resource to have. However, one thing that、uh, really bothers me and that I think is detrimental, it's not helpful for students, is when、uh, students are in a lesson and they're practicing conversation and they Reach a point in the conversation where they don't know the word they want to use. They know it in their native language and they don't know how to say it in their target language. They pull out their dictionary, they say to the, the person listening to them, their practice partner in their lesson where they have a limited period of time, just a moment. And then they look it up on their phone. It takes a few seconds, the, the flow of the conversation stops, and then they say a word. And it's like, whoa, no, that's not, you don't have that ability. You don't have the ability to do that in a conversation with a native speaker. Most people, like if you go to a bank and try to open a bank account, are you really going to pull out your dictionary and sit there and try to 
communicate, you know, just a moment, just a moment. As you look up each word you don't know, no. Or if you do, that's not a real conversation. So instead, try using a different strategy. By that I mean, if you find a word you don't know in conversation, explain the word to your conversation partner. Maybe they know the word. If you're speaking with a native speaker, this is a chance for them to teach you a word. I find that when people take the time to teach me a word, I remember the word much better than just looking it up on my dictionary. So try to resist. Maybe you can bring a dictionary to your lesson, but don't use it or try not to use it in your conversation practice. It's just, it destroys the flow of a conversation. So instead, practice the skill of describing the vocabulary word you want to use and learn how to ask the meaning of a word or learn how to ask for a vocabulary word from your partner. So you can use an expression like, ah, what's the word that means blah, blah, blah. Or, um, you know, it's this thing that does this and this and this. So this is an opportunity for you to describe characteristics of something or find a different way. You can use your body language. You can use whatever. You have a lot of tools, but try not to use a dictionary in a conversation because it's not realistic. Train responses to common questions. Number six is a quick one, I think. Number six, hint number six I have is just to train responses to common questions. Train responses to common questions. So for example, uh, a very common question in English is, hey, how are you? You should know how to answer this question. Just have a default response. Hey, how are you? I'm good. <laughs> like, if it takes you a long time to answer the question, hey, how are you? You need to practice. I think that's a pretty good uh, a pretty good indicator. So, for example, sometimes I ask students a question like that they they haven't quite gotten the idea of how to respond just yet. They they they're not so quick at responding. I say, uh, "Hey, how are you?" And they say, "Yes." And then they think and they go, "I'm uh, I'm uh, good." <laughs> and it's like that's a very common question. So think about just a default response that you can spit out that you can quickly say. If it's, "How was your weekend?" or "Hey, what's up?" or "What do you want to do for dinner tonight?" Think about like just a handful, meaning just a few responses to those questions and train them quickly. Just, "How are you?" "I'm good." "How are you?" "I'm okay." "How are you?" "Not bad." There's three. So it's just training responses to those questions. There's no reason to be surprised by a question like, how are you? Like, that's a very common question. So for those common questions, train responses to that. We've got a bunch of videos, especially beginner level videos for some example responses you can do. So don't get stuck with these little questions. Just train a few responses. Practice a few responses till they feel natural to you. It'll save you time and it'll help the person asking the question too to move forward in the conversation. Yay! Study with materials that don't provide a translation. The next tip is to study with materials that don't provide a translation. So by this I mean if you're using worksheets and, or some kind of textbook uh, or whatever, and it has your target language, the language you're studying, and it has your native language next to it. While this can be useful, I feel that if you can, studying your materials only in your target language and then simplified explanations for more detailed points also in your target language can be a little bit better. So. I, sh I don't want to say like you should only study things in your target language and nothing from your native language because of course like it's, it can be helpful sometimes to look up a word or to understand a grammar point in your native language. But where possible, if you can find something that provides simplified explanations in your target language, it can be really, really helpful because again, you're thinking, you're learning to think on like a simpler on a more basic level about the language you're studying in the language that you're studying. So this can be really, really good. So finding some materials to use where there's no translation. Maybe you can practice, um, of course, with, with books and with written materials, but also with like video materials as well. So there are a variety of different ways that you can um, find materials in your target language, um, like 
in video and TV. So some things to think about there are the level of vocabulary words people are using in the media content you're watching, um, who the media content is intended for, children, young adults, adults, uh, the speed at which the speaker is talking. So like I have the ability to change the level of difficulty of uh, videos based on the rate of speech, the vocabulary words that I use, and how many like idioms and things I use. So I could make a video very difficult. We could make a very like a very difficult video series by leveling up our vocabulary use or by speaking very quickly. Or as you might see in like our English in three minutes series, um, we can also use very simple vocabulary and speak at a low rate of speech. So maybe right now this is a very intermediate level video. So please think about that. So not just for um, written materials, but also for your audio and visual materials. Think about um, who your audience is, the level of the material, and so on. It can be really fun uh, and it can be helpful to think about um, your, your target language in your target language. All right, we're almost done. Study phrases in addition to single vocabulary. The next tip is study phrases in addition to single vocabulary words. So yes, of course, vocabulary is important, but I find it personally very, very useful to look at how a vocabulary word is used in a phrase because sometimes using it in a phrase helps you understand the nuance of that vocabulary word really, really well. So if I, like a word like crazy, for example, in English, depending on the situation where the word crazy is used, it could mean something different. It could mean like a person who is mentally confused or mixed up. It could also mean something really good. It could mean something really bad. So if we look only at the word crazy, it's quite difficult to understand really the meaning of the word. But if you look at the way the word is used in a phrase, you can get a lot more information. So take a look at the way people use words in phrases, not just as single vocabulary words. You can learn a lot more that way, I think. Do your daily activities in English where possible. The next tip is to do your daily activities in your target language. Uh, so if you're studying English, that means try to do some daily activities in English if possible. So this can be very, very boring stuff, but just think about it when you're doing the activity. So like right now, I'm filming a video for EnglishClass101.com or I'm going to work, I'm cooking breakfast, I'm doing the laundry. What do I have to do tomorrow? So Try thinking about your everyday life in English if you're studying English. Try thinking about your everyday activities, the people that you meet. What are you doing? So this is a way to help you practice your verbs. So if you don't know, if you're, I don't know, you're doing something at work and you're like, oh my gosh, how do I explain the, what's the verb for, you know, a picture? Like I want to blah, 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 a picture. What's the word? You can check a dictionary at that point and go, oh, it's draw. I, I need to use the verb draw for draw a picture. So you can find these little gaps in your everyday life, these little gaps in your knowledge, if you think about um, your everyday activities in your target language. If you don't think about it in your target language, you might not realize you have vocabulary gaps or phrase gaps here and there. So this is a really good and kind of funny, actually, way to study. Use a learner's dictionary for new words. The last tip is to use a learner's dictionary for new words. So in English, there are learner's dictionaries available in English. So uh, my favorite, my personal favorite is Merriam-Webster. Merriam-Webster is a fantastic dictionary resource. They're so interesting and they have tons of like historical information. I really do just sit and like read things on the dictionary page lately. It's true. But, um, of course, there's a definition, there's a meaning for words, there are example sentences for words, but Merriam-Webster also has what's called a learner's dictionary. If you find a word that you don't recognize, you can check it at, uh, in a dictionary, in a learner's dictionary, and it gives you a simplified, a simple explanation in simple English of that word. So instead of checking it in your native language, you can check it in your target language. So again, this helps you to understand the word um, that you are, that you're focused on, but you understand it from um, the language you're studying, not from your native language. So using a learner's dictionary can be really, really useful as well. <sighs> All right, 10 ways to report speech. Let's go. Say. 
The first word is say, say as a verb. Say is a very neutral word you can use to report someone's speech, to explain something someone said in the past. So for example, he said the barbecue was canceled. Hmm, just a simple neutral report. Tell. The next verb is tell. Tell is used when one person is giving information to another, to tell someone something they did not know before. Don't say, tell me your phone number, that's weird, but like, uh, can you tell me where the station is? Can you tell me where to buy a hamburger? Can you tell me where to pick up my new car? Like, so giving someone information they don't know or, or on the other hand, explaining something one way to another person. So. Don't tell me what I can't do is a very good Lost reference if you've ever watched Lost. Uh, so tell. Another example sentence. My boss told me I was doing a good job. Speak. Uh, the next one is speak. Speak. So we use speak when we're talking about uh, language ability, like I speak English, I speak Japanese. We can use speak in the past tense to report something but it usually sounds a little more formal. So like, I spoke to my boss about, or I spoke to my parents about, or I spoke to my boyfriend or girlfriend about, blah, blah, blah. That using speak instead of talked uh, makes it sound a little bit more formal. So you can use speak, but it's going to sound polite. In a sentence, my colleague spoke with me about an upcoming project. Was like, Okay, the next one, uh, the next two actually, are very, very casual expressions. So when you're speaking with friends and you're kind of talking about a quick, maybe somewhat emotional conversation, you will hear native speakers, especially Americans, perhaps this is unique somewhat to Americans, use the phrase was like. I was like, he was like, she was like. This is a very casual way to report speech. And you'll hear it often very, very quickly together. Uh, so someone will say, I was like, what? And then she was like, no. And then I was like, yeah. That's the kind of pattern you'll hear it in. Very, very quick ways to report speech, but the subject changes. I was like, he was like, she was like, we were like. This is a way to share what happens quickly. Instead of I said, he said, she said, which might sound a little too formal, we can use I was like, he was like to do that instead. So this is a really fun one. And if you can use this uh, naturally, I think that it'll really help you sound more natural too. So in a sentence, and then he was like, I love that movie, was all. The next one is also uh, similar to was like. We have the expression was all. So was all, uh, don't worry about all. All does not have the meaning of the whole of something or a complete something. Instead, was all, this set phrase, is used to report speech. Usually this one is used when there's some kind of emotional, uh, emotional aspect to your conversation or it's a little dramatic or maybe a little exciting. We use it the same way as was like in that very, very quick style of speaking. And then he was like, and I was all, and then she was like, and I was all. We use those together, but I was all has a little more emphasis. I feel I tend to use it when, my, when I want to express a stronger emotion. And I was all, no way, or and I was all, what? So <laughs> you can use it for those very like surprised emotions or maybe angry emotions was like and was all are both used in very casual situations. So in a sentence, and I was all, oh my God, me too. Talk. The next word is talk. So talk, similar to uh, say, is a fairly neutral verb when reporting speech. You'll use it in a situation where someone is giving new information uh, to you. Uh, but maybe it's a two-way conversation. So for example, we talked about blah, blah, blah uh, for a topic, or uh, my boss talked to me about blah, blah, blah. So maybe new information is being exchanged, but the conversation is two-way. There are multiple participants. With tell, it's like the nuance is sort of one person is reporting information, giving information, with talked, it's, there's an exchange happening there. 
So keep in mind when you use the word talk, you will say either I, I talked to or I talked with someone. Uh, and then you'll usually have a topic. So I talked to my friend about blah, blah, blah. Uh, I talked to my friend about my new apartment. I talked to my boss about a raise. I talked to my boss. No, I talked to my dog about what dogs do. <laughs> so it, there's some kind of there's some kind of exchange happening there. You'll need to use to or with uh, when you're referring to the person or entity you're talking to. And you'll use about to refer to the subject. So uh, you can use this one, um, yeah, when you're when you want to discuss exchanges of information. So in a sentence, she talked to me about my family. Mention. Let's go to the next one. The next one is mention. Mention is used when like something is just there's just one small point in a conversation, like just a little side note or. Maybe it's not the focus of a conversation, but just something someone says quickly, or there's just a little thing that you hear. Oh, you mentioned something about blah, 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 or you mentioned that a new project, like it's, it's maybe not the focus of the conversation, but something that you heard a little bit about. That's, that's when we use the verb mention. We can also use it in a statement, like please uh, mention any skills you have on a resume. So it, the nuance is sort of like a, like just a little bit of information uh, is when we use mention. So in a sentence, our manager mentioned upcoming changes at the company. To go on and on. Okay, the next expression is to go on and on. So to go on and on means just to talk for a very long time. So maybe you have a coworker or a friend or a family member that just talks and does not stop talking. Uh, we say to go on and on. That's the expression we use. So in a sentence, the speaker at the seminar was going on and on about the topic. If you really want to emphasize it, you can say it was going on and on and on and on and on. That really emphasizes that the person continues to speak. So if you know somebody, um, who does that a lot, you can use this expression to talk about them. According to. Uh, the next expression here is according to. According to is used uh, actually in the news or like to officially report something. So according to sources or according to the police, according to the government official, according to my teacher, according to my mother, these are like direct reports of information and they're direct reports of information from a specific source. So according to the newspaper, my f neighborhood has 50,000 amazing ramen shops. That's not true. <laughs> but if I want to, instead of just saying my neighborhood has 50,000 amazing ramen shops, I'm giving a source for that. So according to my newspaper, this is, th this is where I got the information. So this is important to use in news and newspapers and any kind of official documentation you will see and hear according to in these cases. Ah, in a sentence, according to a witness at the scene, the suspect escaped. Report. Great, so um, the next one is report. So report, similar to according to, we use report in more official situations. So to officially share information, like to report to the police, to report to your teacher, to report to uh, your boss. Sometimes it means to submit documentation, like to, to give someone a written report. Sometimes it's to share information officially, just, just with your voice, to report news or to report an update. Uh, so when you want to give, an, give official information, we'll use the verb report. So in a sentence, sources in the area report that the accident was not serious. Thank goodness. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Top 10 must know phrases for the restaurant. Let's get started. A table for three, please. A table for three, please. You tell them the number of people that you are total so that the host can bring you to an appropriate table. A table for two, please. A table for five, please. Could I please see a menu? Could I please see a menu? Usually menus are given to you as soon as you sit down at your table. But if that's not the case and you need to ask, this is a polite way to do it. Could I please see a menu? I'd like to try this dish. I'd like to try this dish. 
When looking at a menu, hopefully you'll find something you want to eat. I'd like to try this dish. Could you leave out the onions? Could you leave out the onions? If there's an ingredient in the dish that you're ordering that you don't want, you can always ask the waiter if it could be prepared without that ingredient. So for example, I might say, could I get the burger but with no cheese? Could you pass the salt? Could you pass the salt? When you're at a restaurant, especially if you're at a big table with a lot of people, you might not always be able to reach things. So you would ask, could you pass me the salt? Could you pass me the ketchup? Could you pass me another napkin? Waiter, waiter. A waiter is someone who takes your order and brings you food. In America and in many other Western countries, it's more polite to call a waiter to your table by simply saying, excuse me? Or if you see another waiter walking by, but it's not your waiter, you can always say, excuse me, if you see our waiter, could you please let them know to come to our table? Is there any dairy in this dish? Is there any dairy in this dish? This is something you would say if you have a dairy allergy, a dairy intolerance, or you just don't like dairy. You're asking the waiter about the ingredients in a particular dish. I do this all the time. Is there any cheese in this? No? Okay. And if there is an ingredient that you don't want, for example, onions, you could say, are there any onions in this? And the waiter might say yes. And if you don't want it, you could always request, could you leave out the onions? Could you prepare it without the onions, please? Can we get separate checks? Can we get separate checks? This is actually something that's very common, especially in America. If you might go out with a group of friends, or even if you're on a date, sometimes you might want to get separate checks, pay for your own things. That way, you can all pay separately just for what you yourself ordered, and you won't have to worry about owing each other money or calculating off a big, huge bill. Are there any specials today? Are there any specials today? A special at a restaurant is a dish that isn't usually on the menu. It's something that's special, but it's a special that the chef is offering that day or that week or that month. So sometimes if you don't see what the specials are, you'd ask your waiter, excuse me, are there any specials today? Could we have the bill, please? Could we have the bill, please? This is how you request that the check or the bill comes to your table. Could we get the check, please? Could we get the bill, please? You're asking this to your waiter, who will then bring you the check and you can pay. 10 words that you can use at a bar. Let's go. To buy a round. The first expression is to buy a round. To buy a round means uh, to buy a round of drinks, essentially. A round of drinks means one drink for everyone in your group, one drink for everyone in your party. By the way, the word party is used to mean group at a bar or restaurant. The number of people in your party is the number of people in your group. So to buy a round means to buy a drink for everybody. In a sentence, our boss began the party by buying everyone a round. In a different sentence, you're buying the next round. On the rocks. The next expression is on the rocks. On the rocks is a way to order a drink. When you say on the rocks, it means your drink on ice only. So rocks are the ice in your glass. So you can imagine the ice, the pieces of ice in your glass, the ice cubes or an ice ball, these are like rocks. So saying I'd like uh, whiskey, for example, on the rocks means just whiskey. Uh, served over ice. That's what on the rocks mean. So in a sentence, I'd like a gin on the rocks. Straight up. The next expression is straight up. So a straight up drink is different from an on the rocks drink. A straight up drink is chilled uh, with ice, but it's strained. So there's no ice in the drink, but it is. it has been chilled with ice. So a straight up drink, there's nothing else in the glass, but it is a chilled drink. In a sentence, uh, I'd like a martini straight up. Some people use the word straight or straight up, but they mean neat, which is the next word we're going to talk about. So keep in mind straight or straight up means chilled. Uh, that's one of the key points here. So yeah, a martini straight up is a chilled martini. Neat. So the next expression is neat. Uh, to order a drink neat means the drink is not chilled and there is no ice. It's just it's just the, the alcohol, it's just the liquor. There's nothing special about it. A neat drink 
is only the drink. That's it. Nothing happens to it. So, in a sentence, I'd like a whiskey neat. Pint. Half pint. The next expression is really two expressions. These are words you use when you order beer. They are pint and half pint. Depending on the country that you live in, pint can be a different size. They vary uh, by a, f a few milliliters depending on the country where you live in. A half pint then is roughly half of the pint size. So a half pint and a pint uh, are two ways, two sizes we use to order beer. In a sentence, can I have a half pint of this stout? Chaser. The next expression is chaser. So a chaser is something you use to follow an alcoholic drink. Chasers are often used after shots. So shots are small drinks that are usually kind of strong in alcohol content and they have a very strong taste. So some people like to have something after that. Uh, they call it a chaser. So the image is that the, the second drink is chasing the first drink into your body. You can think of it that way. The chaser is a non-alcoholic drink. So it could be water, it could be soda, it could be something like that, juice maybe. Mm. So chaser. In a sentence, shots of tequila are often followed with chasers. To be tipsy. The next word is to be tipsy. To be tipsy is a way to describe your feeling when you're drinking. So if you can imagine when you're, uh, when you're standing straight up, uh, when you're standing as regular, you're very like confident and tall and you don't move very much. But if you feel tipsy, this comes from the verb to tip, like this. So something tips uh, to one side or another. Uh, think of your body in this way. So we use the word uh, tipsy, the adjective tipsy, um, to describe this feeling. Maybe you're not so steady on your feet. You could tip over ah! at any time. That's called being tipsy from alcohol. Okay. So, in a sentence, uh, let's see, I'm a little tipsy, I need some water. To be drunk. The next expression is to be drunk. So, we talked about the word tipsy. So, tipsy is a little bit, like, a little unsteady, but drunk is just a mess. <laughs> you're, just, you're just a disaster. I mean, you're being noisy, you're being loud, it's difficult to control your body or your friend's body, whatever. So, drunk is usually seen as a negative thing. Um, so, yeah, so drunk. Uh, expresses, yeah, it's, it's just not pretty <laughs> sometimes. So in a sentence, your friend is drunk, let's take him home. To call it a night. The next expression is to call it a night. To call it a night means to decide to finish at the bar, to go home. Uh, you're ready to be done, so uh, here I'm going to call it, I'm going to say, this is tonight, tonight is finished. Mm. So in a sentence, uh, it's been a long evening. I'm gonna call it a night. I mean, I'm going to go home. I'm done. It's a casual expression. Hangover. And then one more that you can use maybe the day after you visit a bar is hangover. So a hangover is a noun. Hangover is uh, the word we use to describe the feelings after drinking too much. So maybe you feel sick to your stomach, you have a headache, your body is sore. There are a number of different feelings uh, you might have when you feel hungover. Uh, to be hungover uh, is another way to say it. But when you have a hangover, it usually doesn't feel very good. In a sentence, I have a hangover today. I'm not going drinking tonight. But the top 25 English phrases, so let's get started. The first phrase is hello. Hello, of course, is used as a greeting. You can greet your friends, you can greet your coworkers, your family with this phrase just by saying hello. Hey, hi, what's up? Hello, sup, yo. Pretty much any time of day you can use hello. Hello? The next phrase is good morning. Good morning is used as a greeting in the morning. You can kind of feel when morning ends for you. Good morning is nice and polite. Or even just morning with your close friends or close coworkers. The next phrase is good night. Good night is fine. We don't use this to greet other people. We use it when we're saying goodbye to other people at night. Uh, family members, particularly mothers and fathers, to say good night to their children before they put them to bed. You can say it to your friend in a text message or in an email if you've been talking for a while. Good night. So the next word to talk about is goodbye. Uh, use it when you say goodbye to your friends, when you leave your friends. Goodbye. Bye, of course. Take care. Have a nice day. Peace out. That's another way to say goodbye. Okay, the next phrase is I'm plus your name. Of course, this is a way to introduce yourself. You can use I'm, in my case, Alicia. I'm Alicia to introduce yourself in any situation. New friend, I'm Alicia. 
Okay, the next phrase is, what's your name? What's your name is used to ask someone else what their name is. So, what is your name sounds a bit... Try to use, what's your name? If you forget someone's name, you can say, sorry, what's your name? Or, sorry, what's your name again? Next phrase is, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you anytime you meet someone new. Nice to meet you is fine. Good to meet you is a little more casual. Great to meet you sounds very excited. Pleasure to meet you sounds like uh, maybe a formal situation or a business context. Okay, the next phrase is, how are you? How are you? Is an, It's just a friendly way to check in with the other person. You can use it with friends, your family, your coworkers, maybe even your boss to a certain degree. Uh, how are ya? How you doing? The next phrase is, I'm fine, thanks, and you? Uh, if you saw English in three minutes, we talked a lot about this phrase. Uh, instead of, I'm fine, thank you, and you, say, I'm good, thanks, how are you? Just shorten it, make it a little bit more natural. How are you? Good. How are you? Great. How are you? Not so good. How are you? Okay. And so on. So when someone says, how are you? Offer, I usually say, I'm good. This week, I blah, blah, blah. Give some information about what you've been up to. Maybe a hobby, something that you did recently, an event, something interesting you saw, whatever. People want to make that connection with you and it's a good chance for you to continue speaking. The next word is please. Please is a polite phrase used when you want something from someone else. You can use this as a response when someone offers you something, like in a restaurant, for example. Would you like more water? Would you like something to drink? Oh, please. The next phrase is thank you. Thank you is used to express your appreciation you can use thank you with everybody. The next phrase is you're welcome, you're welcome. When someone says thank you, you can say you're welcome. Ah, no biggie, I use no biggie as in no biggie is short for no big problem. The next word is yes. Yes, of course, yes means is any positive expression. Someone asks you a question and the answer is a positive answer. You say yes, yep, uh-huh, yeah. We. Oui. <laughs> no. Next, I'm guessing I know it. Yep. The next word is no. No is a negative response to something when you have to give a negative answer. So as you can probably guess, um, the long form of no is negative. I like to use nope. It's very, very casual. Not gonna happen. My parents would use that with me. To soften that a little bit, if you want to show a negative response to something, like let's go out for dinner tonight. What do you want to do? Like, do you want to go out? Mm, not really. Mm, no, I don't think so, mm, to soften it. The next word is okay, okay. This word comes from copy editors. Okay, when they had to check a manuscript, um, they had to label the manuscript all clear, A-C, but because they were copy editors and they have a very, very sick sense of humor, they thought they would mark it okay for all clear to make a joke because O and K do not start all and clear, but it caught on among everybody in the world. <laughs> Anyway, okay uh, is used to agree with somebody else. Well, it can be used actually to express a positive or kind of a slight negative, I feel. Transitioning in your conversation, you can say, okay, now we're going to talk about blah, blah, blah. Okay, the next phrase is excuse me. Excuse me, it's used to get someone's attention in English when you don't know the other person. For example, in a store, a supermarket, maybe a stranger on the street, you need to ask directions. You can use excuse me. You can use excuse me in the supermarket. Excuse me, can you tell me where the hot sauce is? If you've done something rude in public, you can use excuse me. I personally do not do rude things in public ever. <laughs> I'm sorry is the next word we're gonna talk about. I'm sorry is used to apologize when you have made a mistake or someone you know has made a mistake and you're connected to it, or you just feel bad, you can use, I'm sorry. You made a mistake at work, I'm sorry. You forgot to feed your cat, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. You bump someone next to you, oh, sorry. What time is it is the next phrase when you need to check what time it is. What time is it? When you ask someone else what time it is, maybe you say this to yourself too. Check your watch, check your phone, check a clock. Pretty straightforward phrase. There aren't really any short versions, so. That's an easy one. <laughs> Where is the plus a location? So you can use this for um, a building or a store. We don't, we're not gonna use this where is the for a place, a city name or a state name or a country name. To do that, you would need to remove the 
But where is the bank? Where is the post office? You can use this to ask directions, to ask for help in your house or at work. Where is the copy machine? Where is the file I need? Where is the blah, blah, blah? And where is the bathroom is perhaps a very important question to know. The next one is, may I use the restroom? May I use the restroom is a polite uh, and soft expression that you can use if you need to use the toilet, you need to use the washroom. And when you're at someone's house for the very first time, when you're in a place that you're that is new to you, you can ask, may I use the restroom? More casually, can I go to the bathroom? To be very polite, you can say, may I go to the bathroom? The next phrase is, I would like to order something. You can use this at a restaurant, probably, or in any situation where you need to place an order. I'd like a pizza. I'd like a beer. Can I get the check, please? This will be used at a restaurant. When you've finished your meal and it's time to go, can I get the check, please? In a very, very casual situation, you can just say, check, please, that's fine. The next phrase is, see you soon. See you soon is used with friends and family members, perhaps, uh, when you expect to see them again soon after saying goodbye to them. This is used at the end of the conversation. You're going separate directions. You say, see you soon. See ya is also good, or just see you. To make it a little more formal, you can say, I'll see you again soon. Make a full sentence out of it that way. The next phrase is see you later. See you later is very similar to see you soon, but the point is with see you later is that you're probably going to meet that person again later on in the same day. The last phrase is really. Really is a very useful word because you can use it to show you are interested in a conversation with upward intonation. Really, really, tell me more. Or to show that you're not so interested in the conversation with downward intonation, really. So there are many other words that you can use similar to really in this way, like seriously or oh, oh, and so on. So it's a really good practice for your intonation. The ways to say hi, this should be fun. Let's get started. First is yo. <laughs> This one is a little bit casual, in case you couldn't tell. Used for close friends, maybe family members, if you have kind of a silly relationship with them. It's just quick, short, easy to do. In a sentence, yo, how's it going? Howdy. Howdy, uh, traditionally associated with cowboy culture, I suppose. You should play a banjo, maybe, or you've just gotten off a horse. I don't know. I use howdy from time to time. Howdy. 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 Dun -dun 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 -dun. That was my banjo. <laughs> Yeah, in a sentence you might say, Howdy folks, welcome to the barbecue place. <laughs> Next is hey. Hey is a good friendly phrase. You can usually use hey with a wave and smile, look happy. If you don't, people might think that you're down in the dumps. People might think you're not in a very good mood. In a sentence, hey, uh, I heard you got uh, engaged last week. Congratulations. Something like that. It's usually kind of a cheery, happy expression. All right, next is what's up. Uh, what's up is the long form of sup. This does not literally mean what is above you right now. If you want to be funny, you can say the ceiling or the sky, but that joke gets old really fast and chances are the person you're talking to has already heard it before. It just means what are you up to? What is going on with you? In a sentence, what's up? Did you have a good weekend? Typical response to what's up is not much. Find out some more responses in English in three minutes. We did an episode on this. Nothing much. How about you? That's pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, the next one is long time no see. You can use this when you haven't seen the other person for a long time. You're at a party or an event or whatever. Anytime it's been a long break. You can decide how long long is. Not the day before or the week before. Maybe a few weeks or a month. Whatever is unusual for you and this other person. When you see them, you can say, hey, long time no see, how have you been? 10 words for talking about beauty and skincare. So let's begin. All right, the first word is makeup. Makeup is all makeup. Everything we're going to talk about, almost everything we're going to talk about later is makeup. Makeup is usually used by women, but maybe men use makeup too. Makeup is uh, usually put on the face to change the appearance of the face in some way. So in a sentence, I use makeup almost every day or I wear makeup almost every day. Use and wear are both okay. The next word is eyeshadow. So eyeshadow is makeup which goes on top of the eye. So the eyelid, this part is called your eyelid. Eyeshadow goes here on top of the eyelid. So in a sentence, what kind of eyeshadow do you use? The next word is eyeliner, eyeliner. So eyeliner is used to draw a line, to draw lines near the eyes. That means it's safe to use near eyes. It depends on the person and their style, but maybe they use eyeliner to make lines in different ways. 
uh, on their on their face on near their near their eyes. In a sentence, eyeliner is really difficult to put on. Okay. The next word is lipstick. Lipstick. Uh, there's also lip gloss too. Uh, lipstick is kind of the traditional, just like a, a single color. You apply it just on your lips, and it gives I don't know. Not sometimes shiny, sometimes a very neutral. I don't know. Depends on the lipstick. Lip gloss gives lips like this very glossy, almost like liquidy appearance. So lipstick and lip gloss have different effects. In a sentence. Uh, you have a lot of lipstick. The next expression is foundation. Foundation is the makeup product. It is applied to the skin, usually of the face. So it's used to make the face seem like all one color, foundation. Maybe people apply it with, I don't know, like a spongy thing or with their hands or What's a brush. Called? There's like a, I forgot what it's called. Isn't it like a sponge? I don't know, something. Is it a beauty blender? Is that a thing? I think so. I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm the wrong person. I don't person know. To... I don't know. Is a, beauty, is a beauty blender a thing? I'm not very good at the beauty stuff either. I don't know. Anyway, foundation is intended to make your skin color appear even. Foundation. So it's called foundation because it's like the base, the foundation for the rest of your makeup. So the foundation is the kind of the basis. So once your skin color is all correct and the same, then the other parts, we can fix the other parts. That's my theory anyway. In a sentence. There are a few different types of foundation. All right, the next expression is blush. Blush is usually applied on your cheeks and it's like a pink or red color. It gives the appearance of blushing. So when we feel embarrassed or maybe we feel excited, our cheeks might turn red. Uh, so blush is makeup, which creates that effect of blushing. This is usually a pink or red color to simulate, to make it look like you're blushing, even if you're not really. In a sentence, do you wear blush? The next expression is bronzer, bronzer. So we talked about blush, which is supposed to give your skin the appearance of being pink or blushing. Bronzer gives skin the appearance of being more bronze or more tan. So you can apply this maybe in summer and it makes your skin look a little more tan, which you might like. Other people also may use bronzer to create shadows because it makes the skin a little bit darker in the places where it's applied. So there are a few different ways to use bronzer. In a sentence, bronzer is nice in summer. The next word is face wash, face wash. So this is a special soap that's for your face, specifically for the face. Maybe your face is very sensitive or you have some I don't know, trouble spots or I don't know. There's a specific wash you use for your face only. In a sentence, a good face wash is important for clear skin. Oh, the next word, oh, the, the dreaded, I have a couple words here that are maybe problems all of us deal with. The first kind of problem word on this list is acne. Acne is an uncountable noun. Acne refers to, usually this is, this a problem happens for like teenagers or people around that age, but adults can also have acne. Acne is like imperfections in the skin. Sometimes they're itchy or they're painful red bumps on your skin, or maybe they're not painful, but they're just blotches or a number of different ways that acne can, can be an issue, which we'll talk about in the next word too. But acne is an uncountable noun is just about that problem, skin problem in general, acne, bad acne. In a sentence, I had acne when I was a teenager. So the next word for today, there are two words here. There's pimple and zit. These are both words we use to refer to the individual um, parts of acne. Acne, we can say, I have bad acne, or maybe my acne is improving today. But acne is maybe the whole condition of your face, like everything, your, your face's situation. Each part, each one of those little uh, problem spots, we, we call that a pimple or a zit. The difference, pimple sounds a little bit smaller usually. Zit sounds a bit bigger and maybe maybe more painful. Um, so, uh, but either way, pimples and zits are both words we can use to describe acne. So in a sentence, I hate getting pimples. 10 words you can use to talk about hygiene or cleanliness. So let's begin. To wash your hands. 
The first expression is to wash your hands. To wash your hands is with soap and water uh, in the restroom somewhere. So wash your hands before cooking or wash your hands after using the toilet, for example. In a sentence, wash your hands after using the bathroom. To shower. The next expression is to shower, to shower, or to shower, or maybe you prefer to take a bath. So to shower is usually standing up, though you can do it sitting down, depending on the country you live in, I suppose. To shower is that, yeah, the water just hits you continuously. To take a bath is you sit in the bathtub. You sit down and you are surrounded by water. That is a bath. Surrounded by water. <laughs> sitting down, surrounded by water, in your home on purpose. <laughs> is a bath. <laughs> if it's not on purpose, you should probably call a plumber. Because <laughs> that is not a bath, that is an emergency. <laughs> Ooh, all right. Uh, in a sentence, I shower every day, or I love taking a bath every once in a while. To brush your teeth. The next expression is to brush your teeth. To brush your teeth. So with a toothbrush, usually in the morning, maybe at night as well, you brush your teeth, you clean your teeth. Uh, in a sentence, make sure to brush your teeth in the morning. To style your hair. Uh, the next expression is to style your hair. To style your hair means to, to arrange or to fix your hair the way you like it. So today I styled my hair like this. You styled your hair like that. I, tomorrow maybe I'll style my hair in a ponytail. I probably won't. <laughs> but maybe you can put your, you can style your hair in a mohawk, or in a faux hawk, or in a bouffant. Bouffant, that's that, focus. Oh. Yeah, it's focusing. Yeah, that's a bouffant. All right, so to style your hair, uh, in a sentence, uh, it takes a long time to style my hair. That's true. My hair is naturally explosive, and so I have to straighten it before, like, everything. And then as soon as humidity gets it, it goes... <sighs> it makes that sound, too. To shave. The next expression is to shave. To shave is to remove hair, like, if you're a man, here, usually. Uh, to remove the hair here with a razor, with another, like a, a, a blade of some kind, or uh, maybe you remove body hair, or hair on your legs, whatever. Uh, you, we use the verb to shave, to shave, uh, with a razor. In a sentence, shaving is a pain, <laughs> or sure, meaning shaving is troublesome. Soap or cleanser. The next word is soap or cleanser. So soap is just used to clean your skin or yeah, to clean your face maybe, uh, to clean your hands. We do not use soap for the stuff you use to clean your teeth. Soap is used for like body cleaner or maybe um, what you use to wash your clothes. Uh, so soap or uh, body cleanser. In a sentence, I like nice smelling soaps and cleansers. That is true, who does not? Hmm. Deodorant. The next word is deodorant. Deodorant. So deodorant is the product you might put on your body to prevent unpleasant smells. So usually uh, it goes in this region. So this is called the armpit, this region. So arm and then pit. So like, yeah, kind of this cave-ish area in your arm. <laughs> we call it the armpit. Um, but uh, it's common to apply deodorant here. You might put it in other areas on your body, but the goal is uh, to prevent uh, bad smells or um, to, in some cases, just stop sweating completely. Uh, so this is deodorant. Well, deodorant, actually, if I'm going to be strict here, deodorant is used to uh, stop unpleasant smells. Antiperspirant is used to prevent sweating. So perspirant comes from perspire. So to perspire means to sweat. Anti means not or stop. So an antiperspirant is an, a product to make you stop sweating. Hmm. So deodorant is the smell one. Antiperspirant is the sweat one. Sometimes you can buy a deodorant and antiperspirant together. Woohoo! Great. In a sentence, wearing deodorant is important, especially in summer. Mouthwash. The next word is mouthwash. Mouthwash, I hope, is easy to understand. It's wash. It's something to clean the inside of your mouth. So uh, 
you can use this like uh, in the morning, maybe after you brush your teeth or after lunch, maybe to keep your breath uh, smelling fresh. Uh, but it usually is in like a blue or a green or maybe an orange color and kind of has a minty or citrusy taste. But you put it in your mouth and kind of swish like, I don't know, I can't swish nothing. <laughs> You could swish it around in your mouth and then spit it out and that's mouthwash. So you've washed your mouth with this product. In a sentence, I like minty mouthwash. Toothpaste. The next word is toothpaste. So toothpaste, we do not say like tooth soap or tooth cleaner or whatever. We use toothpaste for uh, the product to clean our teeth. The product we use to brush our teeth is called toothpaste. Uh, so in a sentence, uh, I need to buy more toothpaste. Shampoo and conditioner. The next expression is shampoo and conditioner. So shampoo and conditioner are commonly used together uh, in the shower or in the bath, maybe. Shampoo usually comes first. We shampoo. Shampoo is soap for your hair, really. And then conditioner is a treatment for your hair. Conditioner uh, is used to make your hair feel softer or more moisturized. So oftentimes they are used for shampoo and then conditioner together as a set. So in a sentence, I like trying new shampoos and conditioners. Want to speak real English from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. Gossip. Let's go. Oh my God. So the first phrase is Oh my God, so. So, oh my God, so is an introductory phrase you can use to start your topic with like a surprise factor. So you say, oh my God, and then so is your transition phrase. So for example, oh my God, so I have to tell you about this movie I saw. Or, oh my God, so I saw my neighbor in the shopping mall this morning. Or, oh my God, so did you see my new dog? It's kind of a weird one. Usually it's about a person, not about a dog, but who knows. You won't believe what happened to me the other day. The next expression is, you won't believe what happened to me the other day. You won't believe what happened to me the other day. Meaning, something happened to you and you think it's going to be a surprise to the person listening to you. You won't believe what happened to me the other day. So it's a very fast phrase because it sounds like you want to share very quickly. Like, you won't believe what happened to me. You can drop the other day if you want, or you, say, you can say, you won't believe what happened to me this morning. You won't believe what happened to me last night. You won't believe what happened to me this weekend. You won't believe what happened to me over my winter vacation. So that you won't believe what happened to me gets very, very quick and short. So examples, uh, you won't believe what happened to me the other day. I ran into my ex-boss or, you won't believe what happened to me the other day. I tripped and fell down a flight of stairs. Or, uh, you won't believe what happened to me the other day. I got a new parrot. Sure, I don't know. Maybe one of you can use that. Guess what? The next phrase is very short. The next phrase is like an exclamation, so an excited statement and a question. Guess what? Guess what? So. Guess what is inviting the listener to guess what happened to you? Guess what? Uh, the full question would be guess what happened or guess what happened to me? But we only say guess what? So guess what? And sometimes the listener guesses and sometimes the listener just says what? <laughs> Usually the listener just says what? Uh, as so meaning you should continue the story. So if you say guess what? I quit my job, or guess what? I saw my best friend with a new guy I haven't seen before. <gasps> Another example, uh, guess what? I got a new car. Something like that. So some kind of shocking, like um, difficult to guess situation. I haven't told you about this yet. The next expression is, I haven't told you about this yet. I haven't told you about this yet. So have not becomes haven't. I haven't told you about this yet. So maybe you've told, you have told other people, but this specific person, maybe you have not told that person your news or some information yet. But this yet implies you are planning to or you want to tell them this. So 
uh, it's it's kind of creates a little suspense. I haven't told you about this yet. So we could use this like, I haven't told you about this yet. I'm going to France next summer. Or I haven't told you about this yet, but I broke up with my boyfriend last night. Or I haven't told you about this yet, but I'm throwing a big party for my coworker this weekend. Can you come? Other examples, I haven't told you about this yet. I saw my boss out for dinner with someone who's not his wife. <gasps> Oh my god, that's not true. <laughs> that's not true. Or I haven't told you about this yet. I heard that the company is gonna go bankrupt. <gasps> also not true. <laughs> okay, so those are some pretty juicy, juicy gossip. That's an expression we use. We say juicy gossip is something that's like really, really interesting gossip or a really interesting story about people. We say juicy gossip for that. Have you heard about? The next expression is have you heard about blah, blah, blah. Have you heard about can be followed with a noun phrase. Have you heard about uh, a, a person? You can use a person or have you heard about a situation? You can use both. Uh, you can use a, an object too. So have you heard about the new iPhone or have you heard about the new office policies? Um, you can use that um, for pretty much anything um, you want to inform your listener about. So, have you heard about is usually said very quickly, have you heard about? So the you becomes shortened to ya. Have you heard about? Have you heard about blah, blah, blah. So, have you heard about the new secretary? Have you heard about our new boss? Or have you heard about my coworker quitting his job? Have you heard about the neighbors above us? They're moving. So you can use people here for gossip expressions, or you can use objects um, in this expression just to introduce something new. Very useful phrase. Have you heard about my mom? <laughs> Sorry, mom. I don't know why you came into that one. Okay. So the other day, the next expression is kind of like the beginning to a story. So maybe this can be for gossip, maybe it can just be like a story, something interesting or maybe boring that happened to you. The expression is, so the other day, so the other day, so the other day, the other day here means not today, some other day. Which day? It doesn't really matter, it's not really important, but we say the other day, some day in the past, this expression is used for. So we can say, so the other day I was sitting at my desk in the office when my manager came and asked if he could speak to me. Dun, dun, dun. Or so the other day I was shopping and I ran into my ex-boyfriend. Or so the other day I was renting a car and the former president of the United States came into the car rental shop. What? All right, so the other day, just some day in the past. So I was talking with, and the next one you can use um, maybe for gossip sometimes, but also you can use for making plans. It's, so I was talking with someone and blah, blah, blah. So I was talking with someone means you were having a conversation uh, at another time with a person and you want to kind of report information or share something from that conversation with the person listening now. So I might say, so I was talking with Risa and I think that we should plan a party for this weekend. What do you think? So I was talking with my team about this and I think that we should make some changes. So that's a very kind of everyday work situation use of this phrase. Um, but you can also use it for gossip. Like, so I was talking to my best friend and I think I'm gonna move or I was talking to my parents and I think it's best if we break up. Oh, so it can be for plans, it can be for gossip, it can be for just any conversation plus a report. What's up with? The next expression is kind of a little like mysterious. Then the expression is what's up with blah, blah, blah. Usually what's up with person for gossip, meaning there's like the nuance here is there's some problem or it seems like something's wrong with this person. They're unhappy, they're sad, they're angry, uh, some kind of negative emotion. We use this so it's like, what's up with Stevens? I haven't heard from him lately. What's up with your brother? He seems really upset or what's up with your neighbor? Why is he so noisy? 
or what's up with your boss? He's so strict. So it sounds like there's some problem. We usually use this intonation. What's up with, what's up with, meh, to introduce somebody who has a problem. We don't say, what's up? It's not that. It's not that sort of hello um, expression. It's, a, it's an expression for a problem. You can also use a noun phrase that is not a person here, like what's up with this new office policy or what's up with this new rule at work or what's up with this new item on the menu at this restaurant, it's super weird. So what's up with blah, blah, blah has sort of a negative nuance. You can use it for people to talk about strange behavior. What's up with you? Have you heard from lately? The next expression is, have you heard from blah, 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 lately? Have you heard from person lately? Have you heard from Stevens lately? I haven't seen him. Have you heard from your mom lately? Have you heard from your dad lately? Have you heard from your brother lately? Have you heard from your landlord lately? I don't know why you hear from your landlord, but have you heard from someone lately? There is sort of an ex like a little bit of an expectation that you are in contact with the person involved in this sentence. Like you have some relationship, maybe it's a family relationship, romantic relationship, professional relationship. There's some relationship with this person. And lately it's like, have you heard from them recently, lately, uh, in the last few days, in the last few weeks? Um, so you can use this if, for example, you are looking for someone or you're worried about someone, you can use this here. Um, you can also use it just, just to check in about some other person without asking that person directly. So like if I want to ask about, I'm using Risa in my example, Risa is our Japanese channel host. Um, if I want to ask about how Risa is, but I don't want to ask Risa, I know maybe she's busy or I don't know, for some reason I, I, it's difficult to talk to her. I can ask like a coworker, I can say, hey, have you heard from Risa lately? It seems she's really busy. Or have you heard from so-and-so lately? It seems they're busy. So if I want to ask about another person, but I don't want to bother this person or that something makes it difficult, uh, I can use, have you heard from blah, blah, blah recently or lately to ask about them. Very useful phrase. I have to tell you about Next expression, um, ah, the next expression is I have to tell you about blah, blah, blah. I have to tell you. So have to becomes have to. I have to tell you about. It has a nice mm, mm, mm sound. I have to tell you about blah, blah, blah. Or I have to tell you about something. So I have to tell you about my weekend. I have to tell you about Stevens. I have to tell you about my mom. I have to tell you about my boyfriend. I have to tell you about my girlfriend. Whatever it is, some person used at the end of this sentence creates a nuance like there's exciting news about that person or I have to tell you about this thing that happened. You can use a situation at the end of the sentence too but you're using I have to at the beginning of the sentence so that sounds like it's really important like I feel it's so important it's my responsibility to tell you because this is so exciting. Of course, you can use this in more boring situations as well. Like, I have to tell you about the new office policy. <laughs> you can use it in that way with a very flat intonation. But for gossip purposes, use, I have to tell you about blah, blah, blah. That sounds really good. So what do you have to tell somebody about? I have to tell you about this new idea I have for a business. Or I have to tell you about what happened to me last night. <gasps> okay, so there are these really exciting ways that we can introduce things that happened or that we can talk about people or whatever. Okay, 10 words for talking about space. Planet. The first word is planet. Planet. So planets are those really, really big things that we have in our solar system. Now there are officially eight because Pluto is no longer considered a planet. In my example sentence, Pluto used to be considered a planet. Star. The next word is star, star. So stars are those very, very bright objects that you can see in the sky sometimes at night. The closest star to us is the sun. The sun is a star and we can see a lot of other stars if we look up into the night sky sometimes. In a sentence, it's hard to see stars from big cities. Solar system. The next expression is solar system, solar system. So solar system in our case here on planet Earth refers to the system of planets and objects which are near our star. So our solar system, now there are eight planets in our solar system, used to be nine planets, sorry again Pluto, 
eight planets in our solar system, and then um, we can talk about other objects which maybe enter our solar system, like uh, like uh, comets, for example, or a meteor, or uh, some other events might happen in space within our solar system. So our solar system is the area surrounding our sun and our planets that we know of. In a sentence, Mercury is part of our solar system. Comet. The next expression is comet. A comet is actually an icy body that is uh, slightly melting and then releasing gases. So that's what produces that look, a comet. Okay, in a sentence, comets are really cool. Meteor. All right, so yes, the next word is meteor, meteor, or just meteor. So essentially, meteors are different from comets because comets are made of ice. Meteors, however, are made of rock. So these are two different kinds of objects that, can, that move around uh, in space. In a sentence, uh, lots of meteors burn up before they pass through the atmosphere. Meteorite. Uh, the next word is meteorite, meteorite. So this is an important distinction that many people don't know about, actually. This drives me crazy, too. So a meteor is the, is the space rock. It's in space or it's in the atmosphere. A meteorite, however, is the rock if, if the meteor makes it, if the meteor can pass through the Earth's atmosphere and fall to the surface of the Earth. That rock, then, is called a meteorite. So in space, uh, in the atmosphere, it's a meteor. When it falls to Earth, it is a meteorite. That becomes a meteorite when it hits the Earth. So, fun facts. Okay, that's the difference between the two. In a sentence, have you ever seen a meteorite? Supernova. Supernova, supernova. So, the explosion of a star is a huge event. A supernova is the name of it. So, the star explodes, and that's what we call it. It's called a supernova, a star explosion. In a sentence, supernovas must be incredible things. Black hole. Ah, uh, all right, the next expression is black hole. Black hole. Black holes are the subject of a lot of study. Uh, they have intense gravitational pull, so meaning they have very strong gravity. Uh, black holes will pull other objects into them. Um, it is said that like uh, time stops in a black hole, or in, like if you get too close to a black hole, if you get too close to the event horizon of a black hole, you yourself will be pulled into that hole too. It's pretty crazy. So like the event horizon is the point at which um, there's, no, there's no turning back from, like you can't, you can't escape essentially uh, the gravitational pull of a black hole once you're within the event horizon of that space. It's like crazy, you're done for. All this kind of stuff is so interesting. So in a sentence, black holes are mysterious galaxy. Okay, uh, all right, so the next word is galaxy, galaxy. Before we talked about the expression solar system, uh, so solar system is kind of our region of space, uh, the region we're familiar with. But the next step up, so if you think of the solar system as kind of your neighborhood a little bit, you could think of maybe the galaxy as like your city or your country maybe. It's sort of the next step out. So a galaxy is made up of lots and lots of stars, maybe other planets, other solar systems, many other solar systems in one galaxy. So uh, I think, yeah, we belong to the Milky Way galaxy, I believe. In a sentence, our galaxy is made of lots of different stars and planets. Earth. The next expression is Earth. Earth. Earth is our planet. Earth is the planet we live on. Earth is, yeah, habitable, meaning humans can live here. This word, I included it in this vocabulary list because it is a very good word to practice your pronunciation. It is the word Earth. Earth, that R and the TH sound can be difficult to pronounce together. Earth, Earth. So this is a great word to use to practice your pronunciation. Earth. So in a sentence, our planet is called Earth. 10 words for talking about sleep. Let's go. To wake up. The first word is to wake up. To wake up is to open your eyes, probably in your bed or the place where you are sleeping. To wake up is to, uh, to become conscious, to become awake. <laughs> Every day you wake up, uh, presumably, hopefully. In a sentence, I woke up three times last night. To get up, to get out of bed. All right, the next word is to get up or to get out of bed. So that means to physically move your body from your bed 
out of bed, to stand up from your bed, to get out of your bed. We say to get up or to get out of bed. In a sentence, I got up at eight o'clock this morning. To snooze. The next word is to snooze. So we have to snooze an alarm and also to snooze. So to snooze means to take a short sleep, to have a short sleeping time. Or to snooze an alarm is uh, when your alarm goes off in the morning, you have a button. Most alarm clocks have some button you can press so the alarm will turn on again in like you know five or 10 minutes or something. So to snooze an alarm is to like to ask your alarm to wake you up again a few minutes later. That's uh, to snooze. So we have to snooze an alarm and to snooze, meaning like a short light sleep. In a sentence, I always snooze my alarm at least once. That is usually true. <laughs> to oversleep. The next word is to oversleep. To oversleep means to sleep too much or to sleep late. Uh, actually, no, it doesn't mean to sleep late. Uh, to sleep late means just to sleep until a late time in the day. Uh, oversleep means sleeping beyond the time you wanted to get up. So for example, if my alarm is set for eight o'clock, but I wake up at nine o'clock, I overslept. I slept beyond my wake up time. So we can use oversleep to talk about times when you sleep too much. You sleep uh, more than your body needs you to. So maybe your body needs, depending on the person, like six to nine hours or so. But if you sleep like 14 hours, we can say that's oversleeping. You're sleeping too much. Mm. That's the nuance here. In a sentence, I overslept on my first day of work. Nap. The next word is nap. Nap is a short sleep. So a nap is maybe 30 minutes, one hour, just a short sleep, a short rest. So a lot of people will take a nap in the afternoon, for example, or maybe children actually take naps, for example, in preschool or when they're very, very young. They have a, an afternoon nap, a short sleep, like, mm, yeah, just a, like an hour or so, I imagine. In a sentence, I love naps. Actually, I do like naps. I don't like naps because when I take a nap, it becomes a sleep. It's always like I wake up four hours later and I'm like, well, okay, well, I've destroyed my sleep schedule. Dream. The next word is dream, dream. So dreams are those, those visions, those images you see, those ex maybe experiences it seems like you have when you are asleep. In a sentence, I always have weird dreams. Nightmare. So the next word is nightmare. Nightmare is a word which means bad dream or scary dream, negative dream. So uh, children maybe have nightmares a lot. They wake up crying or they're really upset by nightmares, monsters, uh, terrifying things happening and so on. In a sentence, do you ever have nightmares? To go to bed. The next word is to go to bed. So before we talked about to get up or to get out of bed, this is the opposite. To go to bed means to get in your bed, uh, to, to try to go to sleep, to go to bed. In a sentence, I usually go to bed fairly late. To hit the hay, to hit the sack. The next expression is kind of a, I don't know, a slang expression. Uh, we have to hit the hay and to hit the sack. These both mean to go to bed. Um, they both mean to try to fall asleep, but we just use them in more casual situations. The image here of hit the hay is with your body hitting hay, like laying down in hay. Uh, I believe historically because uh, hay was used to stuff um, things that people slept on. Um, so that's why we have this expression to hit the hay with your body. Same thing for to hit the sack. So a sack full of something soft to sleep on uh, is where this expression comes from. In a sentence, I think I'm gonna hit the hay. To fall asleep. The next expression, it is to fall asleep. To fall asleep, you're in bed and you finally, you lose consciousness. You, you stop being aware, you are asleep. In that moment, we say you fall asleep. In a sentence, it takes me a long time to fall asleep. All right. Want to speak real English from your first lesson? 
Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. Top 10 must-know prepositions and conjunctions for English learners. Let's get started. Two. Two. I threw the ball to my dad. Two is sort of directional. It, it's saying that it's going towards something. I wrote a letter to my mother. I went to the mall. I went to the park. My mom asked me to go to the store to buy some bread. To a destination, to a person. From, from, from is the opposite of to. From implies where it's coming from, the place of origin. So if I'm going to the mall, I'm coming from my house. This letter is from my daughter, from. How long does it take you to get from your house to your job? To and from, they go together. With, with, with. It means together with something. I am at the movies with my friend. I went out to eat with my friends. I go shopping with my boyfriend. With means you are together with something. I like to have grilled cheese with tomatoes on it. I'm here with my book, at. At, at is a very short word. I always go to bed at 11 o'clock, if I'm lucky. I usually go to bed at around one in the morning, unfortunately, I get very little sleep. At specifies a time or a place. Let's go to the movies at two in the afternoon. Um, I'm at home right now, where are you? We decided to meet at the beach. It's a pinpoint of time or location. In, in, in means you are inside of something or in the middle of something. It means being immersed in something. I am in bed right now. The cat is in the box. Uh, the child is in the tree. The plane is in the sky. I graduated school in 2019. In, on, on. I left the book on my desk. On means on top of. I like ketchup on my fries. So that means my French fries are here and I like to put ketchup on them. The man is on the roof. The car is on the street. The motorcycle is on my nerves. But, but, I think I remember her name, but I'm not sure. But is a way to add a negative to a sentence. So for example, I really love eating cake, but I don't eat it often because it's not healthy. I'd love to go to the movies with you, but I have too much work to do. I really like you, but I don't want to date you. And, and, and is a very common word you will hear all the time. It's a way of adding on a new subject or thing to your sentence. I love candy and pizza. I'm hungry and I'm tired. My friend moved to Spain and I moved to Canada. I love playing outside and I love being inside. And is a way to add on a new subject or thing to what you're talking about. So, so, I have a toothache so I went to the dentist. So is a way of adding an example, another way to say, because of this, I did this. You say something, and then you add so, and then what follows is the effect. So there's the cause, so the effect. So, I was feeling very hungry, so I had some pizza. This video is going to be pizza themed, everyone, apparently. I was really tired, so I took a nap. I was in the mood for some adventure, so I got on an airplane and flew to Mexico. That sounds nice. Or, or, or is a way of presenting a choice. So for example, 
You can either have pizza or you can have candy. I don't know if I should go to the movies or if I should go to the mall. Which color do you like better, red or green? It presents differences of choice. Today's video is on words Americans overuse. I haven't seen these words yet, but um, apparently it's gonna be a series of words that we as Americans, I'm American, um, we overuse, we use too often. So let's start. Uh, oh, the first word is definitely. Definitely is definitely a word that Americans overuse. We use it to um, put emphasis at the end of a phrase, to put emphasis at the end of a sentence, uh, as in, oh, that party last week was so great. Yeah, definitely. Or to agree with somebody like that. Uh, oh, God, literally. Oh, just in the last few days, I've seen the word literally so many times on the internet and used in just such stupid ways. The word literally uh, means actually or truly something. This is literally the best hamburger I've ever eaten. So literally meaning truly or actually would mean that in that person's entire life, that is the best hamburger they've ever eaten. However, it gets misused a lot in sentences. Um, like George Bush was literally supporting the war in Iraq or something like that. Taking a phrase like that literally would have to mean that, you know, the president, the former president would be, you know, physically supporting a war with his body. Onward. Onward. Hilarious. Hilarious is the next word. I like to use the word hilarious when something is actually funny. Um, hilarious, of course, means something that is really funny, super funny. It's a step above funny. Maybe two steps, three steps, I don't know. However, people like to use this word in place of laughter. So, uh, for example, friends are talking, and instead of just laughing, the friend will say, that's hilarious. <laughs> well, if it's so hilarious, just laugh. Oh, this must be the last one, because this is the worst one. This word is like. Um, I've probably said it several times already today. For the, for the purposes of this video, um, the word like is used as a filler word. So it's the same as something such as um or uh or hmm, for example. We use like um, as a filler word when we're trying to think of something. You, it's not uncommon to hear the word repeated like three, four, five times in a row when someone is thinking. They'll say, oh, you know that party that I went to? Like, like, uh, like, uh, like, uh, do you know who was there? It just invades your speech sometimes when you're trying to think of something and no other filler words come out, but the word like does. Ah, this wasn't the last word. There is another one. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously is used. Oh, it's, it's good for any time you receive bad news. Um, well, not from your boss. It's a really casual word. Um, but if you hear something um, like your friend lost their job and you can sympathize with them or maybe empathize with them by saying seriously, oh, that's too bad. Or, oh, tell me like all your problems. Oh my God, I just use like, oh God, oh, I hate myself. Want to speed up your language learning? Take your very first lesson with us. You'll start speaking in minutes and master real conversations. Sign up for your free lifetime account. Just click the link in the description.